I'm Tony Gent, I'm Chief Executive at Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust. I'm delighted to be working with Dan and the people at Nature Trek to promote interest in reptiles and amphibians. Um, I've been invited to talk about reptiles and amphibian conservation in the UK, which I must admit is now even more of a challenge after Dan's fantastic introduction to the wide diversity of species that we find world world. First of all, though, I'd just like to introduce who Reptile and Amphibian Conservation is. We're a UK-based charity. We have around 50 staff and we're actually based down in Bournemouth. But although we're based down here, we do have staff around the country, particularly with a small concentration in Surrey. But we do have them, people dotted around through Devon, Sussex, up into Scotland and in both parts north and south of Wales. And these guys are reserves managers, they're species specialists, people who just, um, do GIS and data and science. We have a communications team and of course an admin team that holds us all together. We run a membership, we have around 700 members and around a thousand volunteers help us with what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and we undertake conservation activity. That's basically what we do. We promote the conservation and provide a focus for people interested in the conservation of reptiles and amphibians. We have a UK focus, but we also work in Europe and overseas. And although globally there are over eight and a half thousand species of amphibian and just under 12,000 species of reptile that are recognised, uh, my job tonight is to talk to just about the seven species of amphibian that are recognised as being British and the six species of reptile, or seven if you count the marine turtles that occur in British waters as part of their natural range. So we're just talking about the British species um, and, and just going to be a bit of background to what they do and their conservation needs. Now, they're not distributed evenly throughout the United Kingdom and, and well, the wider British Isles. We have, uh, as I said, 13 species nationally. Um, as we move further north and further uh, west, we see a decline in numbers. So we end up with only nine species in Scotland and only four species found on the island of Ireland. But to understand their conservation, we have to understand a little bit about the ecology. And one of the key factors that influences amphibians is the need for water to breed in, but not only water to breed in, but water that's in connection with a terrestrial habitat where they spend much of their lives. And for reptiles, one of the key features that we look at is their thermal ecology and the fact that they need to have an environment in which they can regulate their body temperature behaviourally, often running from shade to sun or sitting out in the sun to bask. As a consequence, these things determine the habitats we find them in, and they tend to be more open habitats, for example, the natural habitats such as cliffs, coastal uh, habit heathlands, floodplains and sand dunes that are just naturally kept open through natural processes. We have semi-natural habitats, that's those that are managed by man and therefore kept open, for example, hedgerows, woodland edges, scrubland and heathland, and even totally man-made habitats such as churchyards and embankments, the old garden ponds, and a whole variety of other situations such as the drainage schemes you find by the roads, brownfield sites and quarries, all of which provide homes for these species. And for the amphibians, one of the key features is the ponds. And what we find is not only the type of pond that's important, but the habitat they're in. And the, the combination of the shape and the size of the pond the, and the depth will determine the species that you find there. And while we might bemoan the fact we have relatively few species in the United Kingdom, we have one advantage there, and that's that I can give you a brief introduction to all of them in a short talk. So what I'm going to do is give you a quick run through the, the, the cast of characters, starting with the common frog, perhaps one of the best known species, very widespread across the British Isles. It's found in the island of Ireland, um, as well as into all the different countries of the UK. And although the, the adult is often quite well known, this very distinctive shaped animal, it's also very widely known as the spawn that we see, particularly around this time of year, popping up in garden ponds and ponds in, in, in parks, gardens and in the wider countryside. And this sort of tapioca type spawn will um, hatch into these little brown tadpoles. They tend to only grow up to be mottled brown colour. The common toad on the other hand is also a very widespread species, um, characterised by its warty skin. Um, it's absent from Ireland though, and it's a species that's often seen actually this time of year crossing roads as it sort of goes to its breeding sites. And this lays spawn in long, string, long strings, and these hatch over time into little black tadpoles. The natterjack, on the other hand, is much more restricted in its distribution. It's only really found in three types of habitat in the United Kingdom. That's heathlands, dunes and uh, uh, um, marshland, um, so coastal, coastal marshes. 
And these species are limited, particularly throughout England, but only just into North Wales and Southwest Scotland. So it has a much more limited distribution and much more range restricted because of the types of habitat it lives in. One of the features that really defines this species is, this species is the fact it makes a very loud rasping call and it's caused by puffing out a single big pouch under its chin. Much less well known as a native species is the pool frog and it's much rarer. Indeed it's a species that's only been considered native since the late 1990s and that was only after the last population or well, native population went extinct. Um, it's now been reintroduced to a couple of sites in Norfolk. One of the really key features about this species is it makes a very loud quacking sound caused by these puffing out of these little cheek pouches on either side of its face. We have three species of newts, possibly the most widespread throughout the British Isles and indeed into Ireland, is the smooth newt. And this is a species that's found particularly in lowland habitats and it's one kind that very often turns up in garden ponds. On the other hand, the, the palmate newt tends to have a slight preference towards the more heathy habitats, more grassy and moorland, those with more acidic soils. But like everything in nature, that rule isn't hard and fast. However, the big guy, the, the, the bigger of the species and the bane of the developers' lives is the great crested newt. And this species grows typically up to 15 centimetres long, so it's quite a substantial beast. And you can characterise the fatness of it by looking at your thumb. And that's the, the thickness of the, compared to if you looked at your little finger, that gives you more of an idea of what the shape of the smaller newts would look like. This species has a granular skin, which is why it has another name, which is also known as the warty newt. Um, and only the males of the species has this sort of jaggedy crest. Newts lay eggs individually, so unlike the, the neurons which lay them in clumps of, of spawn or strings of spawn. And these eight small eggs are wrapped individually in vegetation and they hatch out into these little tadpoles, which are often known as efts. On the reptile front, again, we have six species. Uh, six species that are counted as being native. Um, we have three species of lizard and the most widespread is this species, the common, also known as the viviparous lizard. On the other hand, the sand lizard, a much more range restricted species, a much more solid and chunky animal that uh, is characterized by being very different between the two sexes during the breeding season. Often the males can be a very bright green along their flanks, while the females tend to be a lot browner. The sand lizard is our only egg laying species of lizard and here we have a photo of a female digging a burrow and, and the, the picture on the top of the screen where we've got that sort of little hole that's what an egg burrow would look like if they didn't successfully lay their eggs in there they leave those open when they lay their eggs which are these small round objects about the size of a new five pence piece they're, they're buried in the sand and the, the holes are covered over and that's where they'll be incubated until they finally hatch later in the year into these small, very distinctively um, little lizards with very distinctive eye stripes and dots along the side. The slow worms are our last species of lizard I'm going to talk about, and that's a legless lizard, and it's differentiated from snakes because of little eyelids, um, and it's got a tail that it can drop, just like many of the other lizard species. We see quite a difference between the males and females. The males tend to be much more uniformly coloured, whereas the females tend to have this very distinct line along the back, which is the lower picture on this, this side. The, the, the picture um, on the side of the picture, we've got a, a, a young of the species. They tend to be a very goldy, coppery colour when they're first born with a very distinctive black line down the backs and black sides. So they start off a very different colour as until they mature into one of the the, the different forms dependent on the sex. We have three species of snake and this is a grass snake. The grass snake is our largest species of snake, occasionally even growing up to one and a half meters long and they have actually been recorded longer than that in the United Kingdom. Um, and it's our only egg laying species of snake and it typically lays eggs in uh, sort of compost heaps and, and the like. The adder on the other hand is characterized by a zigzag pattern down its back. Um, and the, the male tends to be this very black zigzag, um, the one that's on the, <laughs> just trying to work out what he's running at, right, right the screen, and then the, the other, the, the, the brown on the back um, is, is the female. It's also it's only, only venomous species, it's a stocky species of snake, it's much shorter, typically not growing more than 70 centimetres long. And then the last of the cast that we've got here, which is the smooth snake. And this species is a very slender species of snake 
and it's very much range restricted, found only in the heathlands in southern England in the United Kingdom. However, that's not actually all the story because we also have a range of non-native species that are found in the United Kingdom, some of which have established in a breeding and others are just sort of more common, such as the red eared terrapin, simply because of sheer numbers that have been put out as unwanted pets. The wall lizard, for example, lives in at least 40 different colonies dotted around the United Kingdom. The alpine newts turns up quite widely as well. Um, however, species such as the green lizard have a limited distribution with one or two populations, one of which is down here in Bournemouth. Um, Ascalapian snakes have escaped from zoos and there's some found around London Zoo and indeed up in North Wales as well. And the midwife toad has a limited number of populations often living in people's gardens. And the green frogs, the two various different types of European green frogs, such as the marsh and the edible frogs, are found quite widely in different populations around the country. So just to touch on the conservation issues. So why isn't life all rosy for reptiles and amphibians in Britain? Well, there are direct threats to the animals. Obviously, individuals might get predated. Pheasants and cats certainly take their toll. Um, and these predation of individuals can even impact on populations where you've got small populations in limited areas. We also get competition between species and a particular issue that we're concerned about ironically is the competition between common toads and natterjack toads where those that breed earlier which is the common toad will outcompete those that breed later. We've also got disease and Dan actually touched on disease as a big issue and there are a variety of different amphibian diseases that have been recognised in Britain and other ones that we're really worried might become established here. But we've also seen snake diseases. The snake fungal disease has been recorded in grass snakes in Britain. But one of the other issues that traditionally was a major problem, but less so now, is direct persecution. There is luckily less killing of, of adders than there used to be, but there's still some that goes on. And the wider exploitation for trade or, or for experimentation <laughs> that they used to collect them for is now very well regulated and generally doesn't happen as certainly not as much as it used to um, back a few sort of 100 years ago or so. And we also get incidental issues such as incidental capture of animals in netting and this particular grass snake we have captured in netting over a pond or they're caught in fires or squashed on roads and this sort of low level of incidental killing can cause problems for the species. So there are, but perhaps more significantly, is threats to their habitats, and particularly the habitat loss that's caused by activities such as agriculture, forestry, development, and indeed sort of um, road transport and infrastructure, and indeed a wide range of other activities where people get involved and sort of impact on the countryside. For an example of, of the impact of habitat loss, we're looking at heathlands, and we've got some examples from Dorset where we see a reduction from even 40,000 hectares of heathland in Dorset in the late 1700s, right the way down to under 4,000 surviving now. So nationally, we only have a sixth of the heathland present that now that was there in the 1800s. But not only is the area smaller, but the component parts of it are much, more, much smaller and more fragmented. And all of these are much, much greater risk of losing populations of reptiles and amphibians that were present. The habitat fragments that remain too are under threat and pressure from all sorts of things such as the habitat growing up through natural succession, through woodlands growing on heathlands, through ponds slowly senescing and becoming dry land over time and invasive species taking over. In this we've got a picture of some bracken that's moving in um, which will swamp out the, the, the open habitat. Conversely though we get over management or overgrazing of sites that removes the structures that are so important for the species to live in. A similar effect happening through fire. So what can we do about it all? Well one of the key things we can look at is creating and protecting habitats and one of the areas we do this is through creating nature reserves and there's a wide range of nature reserves created by governments and local authorities, conservation charities and private um, individuals. And at ARC we've managed around 80 nature reserves covering around 2,000 hectares of site in all. But other than nature reserves there are designations and these are things enshrined in law which provide protection and positive management for sites. And these for example are the designations of Site of Special Scientific Interest which is a national de 
designation and sites of um, important sites for conservation, such, such as those um, at a European designation. And these allow a very positive management. These have very strong protection in law. There are also a series of local sites, such as local nature reserves and sites of important for nature sites of importance for nature conservation, which really recognises the importance and doesn't provide much direct protection, but is something that is considered particularly in planning decisions. One of the key tools that has really changed the, the fate of reptiles and amphibians since the 19, mid-1970s when they were first introduced is the protection of the species themselves. Um, we have three levels of protection that are now enforced for our reptiles. The strictly protected or European protected species, which include great crested newts, sand lizards and smooth snakes, are protected against a wide range of killing, injury, the protected habitats and all forms of trade and things are prohibited. You can't even pick them up without a license. The second level is protecting against killing and injury and in fact trade as well. And that relates to all of the other reptile species. And the lower level of protection means that none of our species of reptile and amphibian can be traded or, or sold without a, a license. Um, there are other approaches such as bylaws, which in local areas such as the new forest means that you can't pick up or capture any of the animals or any species that are there. And that provides an additional level of protection. However, one of the key areas that we're keen to influence are nature conservation policies. And these policies are much more far reaching. They reach well beyond the, the impacts of protecting sites and protecting individuals. For example, the biodiversity policies that we see um, that influence and create biodiversity duties, which means that different departments must take consideration of biodiversity in their activities and the lists of priority species. And these then become much higher up the sort of consideration in many decisions, for example, land use planning, um, where you see planning obligations, and even now measures to require net gain from all the developments to offset and mitigate the impacts of development. Um, and But the other area that's very important is through funding schemes, because this is the positive incentive to land managers to do the right thing. What we notice, though, is that we do need for reptiles and amphibians generally to have an active intervention management in many areas. Um, and indeed, ironically, on Heathland, we end up doing just about or using everything that you'd assume conservationists wouldn't want to do. We use chainsaws for opening up habitat, removing trees and scrub. We use herbicides, although obviously we're trying to minimise that. Sometimes it's essential for controlling, for example, rhododendron regrowths or for managing bracken. We get the old bulldozers out on sites, and again, you'd think you wouldn't want to do that, but that's important for creating bare ground and, for example, for breeding and for fire breaks. And we introduce grazing and mowing on a number of sites, carefully managed so we can manage the vegetation structure. A key feature for amphibians, though, is the creation of ponds, and it's more than just a case of just add water and everything will be fine. Um, the, the nature of the ponds that you create, where they're located, um, in the habitat they're in will make a big difference. For example, common toads of their larvae are fish tolerant, so they will survive and indeed thrive in bigger, sorry, bigger and deeper ponds. Let's try and go back. While for some species such as natterjack that require smaller ephemeral ponds, these are created and allowed to dry out and they and that helps keep the predator load down for them and indeed we even use um, concrete in some cases to make the habitats for the species but also the other thing is to influence other people to do the right thing and this is important particularly in the much the, the vast amount of amenity land we have in this example here we for example on golf courses in churchyards and graveyards um, allotments I'm sorry, roadside embankments, which is a huge amount available of good habitats, um, farmland, all of these habitats, we can get really good results by providing the right advice to people and encouraging them to do the right thing. Gardens too, if we can only encourage people to create a pond and leave areas that would be a little bit rough, not only is it good for the, the species that can occur there, um, but also a very good way of getting people engaged. And Dan sort of introduced how his enthusiasm for wildlife was inspired by being able to pond dip and go out and see these things. So the very fact you might have slow worms or frogs in your back garden is a very good way of getting people to appreciate reptiles and amphibians. 
Quite often, though, we need to do things that are very species specific. It's not just a case of managing the habitat, but we often need to bring in special measures, for example, species recovery programs to ensure that the specific needs of the species are taken into account. And this might involve managing particular features in the habitat. We've got an example here of a pond, of a bare ground straight, and even a pile of um, vegetation, which is very being designed for grass snakes. And indeed in the Netherlands, there's been some research showing how just by creating these piles of vegetation, you can extend the range of grass snakes, for example, into areas where they hadn't occurred. We also sometimes need to do predator control, not so much by going out and shooting things, but often by the way you manage and manipulate the habitat. Translocation is an important part of a lot of the work we do, um, as is making sure we manage the spread of diseases. And just as a quick example, some of the conservation translocation works that's gone on, we look at the sand lizard, a species that's been introduced to over 80 sites since the, the scheme was first started in the 1960s. Um, and in fact, many of the sites in and around Surrey are only there because of introduction. The species would almost certainly have been lost from nearly all of Surrey had it not been for a conservation reintroduction program. And many of the animals are brought into, into play through captive breeding. Um, and this is an example, the photo here is of, of Chester Zoo. There's a big vivarium there. And over time, we've introduced over 10,000 little hatchling sand lizards into the wild. A different approach is taken for the paw frog, a species that the reintroduction program started in 2006. And here, as Dan has illustrated with the agile frogs, um, a lot of animals are captive reared. We take the spawn, rear it on, and then introduce that to, to, to bolster the population. The species has now been introduced to two populations in Norfolk. Survey monitoring is very important for understanding conservation and we do survey schemes that basically provide the data that underpins the conservation. It lets us know where the species are, how, they, how well they're doing, and it helps prioritise work. We're allowed to you know, use it to identify key sites and assess management impacts. And indeed, surveys um, are often run by a whole variety of people, and this as well as the professional and volunteer surveys, it's a great opportunity to engage and enthuse a large number of people through citizen science programmes. And finally, we do look at a whole range of other approaches. Um, that rather sad sun headline was very much quoting from a number of years back of politicians who clearly weren't interested in conservation at the time. And so a lot of our work is not only to try to turn the, the minds of people who don't like reptiles and amphibians into realising there are something that you really should conserve, but a key part is also engaging those who are already on that journey, already appreciating the species, to give them a greater chance of understanding and getting involved in the active conservation of the species. Just very briefly touching on the, the, the tours that we work alongside uh, Nature Trek to deliver um, in Dorset. Uh, we will be running two, two, two tours this year, um, one running from the 25th to the 27th of April and another from the 22nd of May to the 24th of May. Um, and for further information, as Dan pointed out, do have a look at the website and you can find out um, a little bit more. Um, the tours are based around the village of Corf Castle. We don't actually stay in the ruins of the castle, but you stay in a delightful little hotel um, that's just in the village itself. And that's highlighted by the yellow um, mark on the map. And the tours will have a look at a variety of, of, of sites, including some of the Purbeck Heaths, some of the heaths around Bournemouth, and also travelling further afield to look at the Bournemouth Cliffs and um, a place called Hengisbury Head, which is uh, marked by the furthest um, eastward dot on this map. So an example of what you might see, this is a typical urban heath, this is actually a town common, which is one of our nature reserves um, in Christchurch. Um, and this is the kind of habitat where you could expect quite reasonably to see both sand lizards and smooth snakes. Creech Heath, I've taken a photo of part of Creech Heath that is particularly good for adders, but it also has this pond, which is an area where we have good populations of crested newts. And there's a chance to see both the adders you go out during the day and the newts you go out at night with torches. One of the other areas that's slightly extreme is, is, is the Hengisbury Head, which is a, a site managed by Bournemouth Christchurch and Paul Borough Council. And this is an area where the Natterjack Toad has been reintroduced in these little concrete ponds. And it's been doing very well for quite a long while now. So the, a nighttime visit to that will give us a chance to see Natterjacks. 
and um, obviously hosted by our colleagues at Bournemouth um, Christchurch and Paul Borough Council. We also get little good populations of palmate newts, it's a chance to see those in amongst the natterjacks. And finally, one of the areas we also visit is the, the Boscombe Cliffs, and this is a, a, a slight detour, and the main interest here, strangely, is the non-native species that we find there. And the, the walls are, are very good for wall lizards, and, um, and on the top of the cliffs you also get the introduced green lizard species. It's a slightly mixed story because the introduction of these species has probably pushed out the natives, um, but we also then see that they're, they're very interesting in their own right. So it's a chance to see different species, but also to reflect on that real strange tension between interesting species and the impacts that they would have on, on the native wildlife. So that's all I wanted to say um, about this, and just to let you know a little bit more information of, of oh, sorry, I was just going to say, you're not only going to see herps, you're also going to see other species as well. Um, and one of the key things we'll pick up is, is a load of the birds, the night giants, the woodlarks, hobbies, dartford warblers, and um, species like the stone chat will be sort of pretty much uh, around as, as the primitive chance of seeing those. Um, a whole range of invertebrate species, and this is for example, such as the perfect mason wasp for grayling butterflies, um, heath tiger beetles, and it's unlikely we had a chance to see the ladybird spider, but they are out and about on the heaths as well. And of course, botany. There's a, a range of, of um, not only the tip, typical uh, habitat species, such as the um, uh, erica species, the, the different heathers, there are at least the, the, the different species of heather that you, you'll see on sites, but also things such as the marsh gentian, uh, dodder, bog ash fidel, sun, sun dews, which are illustrated here. So there's a chance, as Dan said, not only to see the reptiles and amphibians, but other species as well. And just to let you know that's who we are and where we're based. Um, and if you want for more information about us, please uh, get in touch through any of these routes. <laughs>